Hello, I am John Najarian here at the NASDAQ with a really exciting company. And I've never been able to say this before, but I'm actually the chairman of the company that Ellie Spiro is the CEO of the SPAC that is purchasing and doing a merger with Nauticus and Nick's company. Nick, Ellie, it's great to have both of you here at the NASDAQ. You had a ton of different companies you could look at for this clean energy SPAC, and you looked at a lot of companies. How did you decide on this company? That was pretty easy. We, we did look at over 65 opportunities, and this by far came to the top of the list. We've said from the beginning that we weren't looking for science projects. We were looking for a company that had a developed technology, that knew what they were doing, that had a clear line of sight to profitability. Nick checked all those boxes. It's a highly disruptive technology in an industry that's ripe for transformation. Houston Mechatronics, as it used to be known, mm -hmm. I used to call it Megatronics mm -hmm. because, you know, that the, this Aquanaut that you guys have created, um, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but that is so cool. And whenever it poses, and it looks like a bodybuilder when it comes out of the pod out of the, that carries it down, um, it kind of flexes like this. You guys over at uh, Houston Mechatronics and now Nauticus, uh, the name of the company, have been working together for 20 years. You guys started off at NASA, and I think when people see and hear about what you've created, it's pretty clear you guys really were rocket scientists. So first tell me about uh, the inspiration that you got from that work at NASA, and then how you translated that into something under the sea, into Nauticus. Frankly, the team is, is second to none, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we grew up together at NASA, and we were in charge of putting robots in very far away locations and, and designing those missions and the technologies that was going to future the, the, the space flight industry f uh, using robotics. And uh, we saw the, the, this incredible opportunity to take exactly the kinds of things we were doing in space and marinize it, to completely disrupt the ocean services industry, which is enormous, by the way. It's a, it's a $1.5 trillion economy. A lot of people don't even consider it. But what we saw and the expertise of the team lend itself so perfectly towards uh, how we do things in space and how we're going to do things differently underwater. I mean, if you can make something happen on the moon that far away, um, you can certainly do something under the water um, in terms of communication to that vessel down there and so forth. And this isn't a tethered robot either. This is a robot. Nauticus is basically something that you bring out to a spot. It could be to repair. It could be to construct. The pod takes it down to the depth that it needs to be. And then Nauticus, you know, this transformer, if you will, transforms and goes to work. Well, at NASA, we never, had the, uh, we never had the ability to tether something to the Earth when we were trying to design it to, to work on the moon. Be a very long tether. And so, uh, so we had to develop all the semi-autonomy architectures because we still have people that are in control mm -hmm. and operating the, 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 the robot. And I think it's worth really uh, stressing that point because uh, there's not really great communication in space. Uh, it's, it's still a pretty austere communication environment. Um, it's rather latent and delayed. And you're not going to put a net Netflix server on the moon anytime soon, I can assure you of that. And so what we saw was exactly the same type of communication technology would alter how people could not only communicate with the robotics underwater, but get them to do useful work in this environment. And let's not forget, there's $24 trillion worth of installed infrastructure in the ocean community, and it all needs repaired. It needs fixed and maintained. Right. And, and the present way of doing these things is rather terribly expensive and, and, and unfortunately, uh, not friendly to the environment. And that's another thing that really drew us to Cleantech's mission. Uh, they were really aligned with us on where we felt this technology had most of its best use cases, is, is altering the ocean services industry in a much more environmentally responsible manner. You know, that $24 trillion in stuff that's under the sea right now, some of it's traditional mm -hmm. energy, some of it's the new energy, um, whether it's uh, waves or whether it's wind farms. And a lot of those, of course, have to be uh, repaired, installed, changed out, all that sort of stuff um, by something like Nauticus. Um, and before Nauticus, um, it was tethered to a ship. And that ship just pulls out there next to, I, I imagine, a bunch of wind farms or something. 
um, and is belching out uh, diesel throughout the day. It's, fuel not, oil. it's not a great visual, John. No, it really and is. it's tethered and it doesn't have near the uh, usability or flexibility that Nauticus has to basically repair what is corroded down there or to install um, an upgrade or whatever it might be, correct? Well, some of these surface ships, they're putting out about 70 metric tons of CO2 per day. Let's say we're trying to do some maintenance or uh, help construct part of a wind farm. It's not really a great visual. And, and stuff that we have considered is, uh, wind farms aren't terribly far from shore. You know, we're not going out 200 nautical miles. And so things that are relatively close to shore and relatively shallow water can be, uh, can, that type of work can be done in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. And so we don't see the necessity nearly as much being reliant on these large ships as, as the present industry is doing these things today. And so I think things that were born in the conventional in, uh, energy industry, I don't feel it's as appropriate for the emerging energy transition industries like offshore renewables. Forbes magazine uh, just recently called you guys the Tesla of robotics, undersea robotics in particular, I suppose, um, which is pretty high praise. This is a rechargeable unit that goes down there. It's not putting anything out into the ocean. Well, there's an entire electrification of the subsea happening right now. Mm -hmm. And the industry is dominated by not only these diesel, large diesel ships, but also the hydraulic infrastructure uh, that runs the current remotely operated vehicles. We operate these with a mouse, mm -hmm. uh, much more like a video game. <laughs> and so we don't have to exchange nearly as much information between the robot. And that's really where our asymmetric advantage comes from. So it's more efficient and yep. it's cheaper for the consumer. And so the users here are gonna get a lot better at what they do and a lot faster with obviously much less diesel going into the air. This is a situation where you have more demand than you have supply. I mean, more companies want um, what Nauticus can do than Nauticus can supply right now, which is a great position Absolutely. to be John, in. Absolutely, as, John, as part of our diligence, we spoke to a number of the players in the space. They're looking and they're chomping at the bit to get access here. When you do a cost comparison, Nick, I think you told me it's about $100,000, is that a day? Mm -hmm. For the use of a traditional, like you said, a ship that goes out there belching fuel oil into the air and all that to a tethered rope, not robot, but to a tethered device under the sea versus you guys. We're over half the expense. Because of the disruptive piece of technology we're bringing, uh, that is also at an extremely high margin for the business. So that's what makes our business, I think, very attractive to public investment like Ellie's bringing to the table, but also the customers that are really craving this. There's a lot of downward pressure in the ocean uh, industry right now to cut costs and especially emissions. It's gonna take not only a technological evolution, but a revolution. And that's really where we're centered on, is putting in the disruptive technologies that are gonna really change this industry. Right, and you know, great example just recently, Ellie, was when uh, uh, that Chinese uh, uh, container ship had to anchor off Long Beach for a long time. And I guess during some rough seas, the anchor dragged yeah. and it ripped open a pipeline. And that pipeline right. had to get both shut down and repaired. And this would have been a perfect example oh, for, for sure. what could have... Could have uh, avoided this, mm -hmm. definitely. When somebody does a SPAC, they raise money and they've got their SPAC. And then during the de-SPAC process, they raise additional funds in many cases, most cases. And um, you guys have already done that. You're already fully spoken for That's right. from the prior That's right, investors. John. That's right. Another one of the reasons why we like Nick and the team is they brought on some very significant strategic investors mm -hmm. who are large public companies that are leaders in their space. Not only did they put money in at the beginning, but they've doubled down now in the pipe. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we haven't had to go out and hire a banker to raise capital for us. I mean, Nick, it seems like you guys could have been short-term greedy, um, got a little bit more money up front right now, um, but then probably lost control of the company, um, not, a, not as much in control of your own destiny. And um, instead, you guys, because probably during this great resignation, we talk about it all the time, the average employee is staying at firms two years mm -hmm. now instead of 10 years. You've got employees there 20 years. I guess you'd probably call them partners um, that have been with you for 20 years as you guys uh, built out what is now Nauticus. I founded this company and, and hired in uh, about 25 former NASA roboticists. And it speaks volumes to the mission that we all feel compelled to, to, to attack together. 
and uh, it gives me pride every day as, as I come into the company and, and, and I look at our team. Again, it's just, it is second to none. The amount of talent that we've attracted. Um, yeah, the great resignation is a big deal and, and we see that every day. But we have this core nucleus of the team which really provides that leadership that, and I think that inspires me and, and the others around them to just keep on this mission. And, um, and, I, and I think it's primarily, there's the three major market forces that are moving this. We have the, the economic, the technological, and the social. And, and never before uh, have we had such social pressure to reduce carbon emissions. So you can check that box. Mm -hmm. um, technologically, for the first time, we have the technology born out of space flight to really change the ocean services industry. And, and economically, uh, we're doing it at a price point that is enabled by, by that technology. And so those three forces are keeping the team together. They're keeping us on that path to, to really disrupt this industry. And uh, it's, it's really what keeps us, uh, the fires lit. Well, um, as, as you know, I, so I'm the chairman of Ellie's company here, the SPAC that is now merging in with you guys. And it's a hitter's list of folks that Ellie put together on that team. Um, and I'm not counting myself there, Ellie, but I mean, Energy Secretary and former Governor Bill Richardson. I mean, and he was blown away by your technology. So that says a lot right there. Al Weiss, uh, president at Disney, that was really in charge of getting Disney uh, more green uh, by, you know, not just the theme parks, you can imagine how much um, it, uh, in waste and everything else, you can turn into something else at a Disney theme park or with those ships and things like that. Al Weiss was the president of Disney for, uh, I think, over a decade. Over 20 years. Over <laughs> 20 years. Um, all those folks blown away by what you guys do and what you're going to do um, at Nauticus. And I love the new name, too. And the Aquanaut. Um, you know, we've been showing a little bit of what the Aquanaut looks like. Um, because I'm colorblind, I think it looks red when it's above the water and yellow below the water. And I guess that's close because you said there's a color shift as the aquanaut goes down. It right. looks yellow. So we call her the happiest robot in the, the ocean. <laughs> and uh, we, have a, we have a model and a mock-up. And sometimes I'll come in and the employees have, have, have drawn a smiley face on, on the robot. And, I, you know, we like to have fun and we like to kid around. But, uh, you know, I, just going back to the team, it's, it's, I, I'm just, it's such an honor to be able to work around uh, such inspiring people. And lastly, I guess, Ellie, uh, I know you want to go down and get in the pool with the Aquanaut, uh, <laughs> and he's trying to talk me into it too. Um, but that, uh, it, it's not surprising that, that, that this big, huge pool, um, not like a swimming pool at all, but a gigantic pool 40 feet deep, yep. um, was basically where astronauts would train repairing the space shuttle or the International Space Station and things like that. And it's where the Aquanaut trains. Um, Nauticus trains as well. That's right. Uh, we've been very fortunate to, to uh, have started the company near NASA. Uh, NASA has such incredible facilities that we've gotten to take advantage of. And NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Lab, or the NBL, uh, has allowed us to really develop quickly and train the robot. Because at the end of the day, we are a, we are a deep technology company. We're a marine autonomy company. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a good contract set up with NASA. They allow us access into that pool. And that's where we train the robot. And of course, it goes out into the ocean, goes out into the bay. But sometimes you need a controlled environment to be able to study and endow the machine with the intelligence that is the most disruptive part. At our core, we're, we're an artificial intelligence company. Mm -hmm. um, people focus a lot on the big orange robot that we're putting in the ocean, but it's really the intelligence of that machine that honestly we've spent 20 years developing, born out of NASA, inspired out of NASA, that is now uh, is front and center on, on how this machine thinks and how, it's, and how it's able to actually do the actions that we need in the water. I think this is gonna be huge. I know people that are looking for green investments, ESG and all the rest, are definitely going to be focused in on Nauticus. And so thanks to both of you for bringing it to us here today. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I think it's worth mentioning as well, uh, you know, we, we had several folks that were really courting the company to take it to this next level. And I think the first time you meet Ellie, you, uh, you just get this feeling, you get this sense about you. And it's not only the mission that they had, their investment thesis, but it was also the direction that uh, we were taking the company. And the two just, they just married up very quickly. And, uh, and to Ellie's point earlier, um, we had a long range view of, of putting out a company that had a uh, public 
facing persona that was going to grow and, and, and really grow into uh, where, where it was heading. At. Nick, Ellie, thank you. Great to have you guys here. So folks, I am John Najarian here at the NASDAQ with Ellie Spiro and Nick Radford, uh, the founder and chairman of uh, Nauticus, the new name for the company. It's not a science project. It's something that is working right now, and you should be looking into it. Thank you.